Welcome to the AMP Academy. What we're going to look at today is how direct metal 3D printing, aka laser powder bed fusion works, and what you can print with it. It's a process that is radically different from the types of 3D printing that are getting super popular for makers, schools, and fab labs. Those are all based on polymers. But if you're already familiar with those, you've got a head start when it comes to understanding this process and designing parts that will actually work in metal. But first, what does this process look like for printing usable parts out of metal? Now, there are a bunch of different approaches to this, all with their own pros and cons, but the fastest and most direct way is laser powder bed fusion. It's likely what you're already thinking of when you hear metal 3D printing. Just like with every layer-based additive manufacturing process, it starts by slicing a 3D CAD file into fine layers, automatically adding support structures and other features where needed. These 2D layers are what guide the laser within the printer to melt and weld this fine metal powder in exactly the right spots. After that, a thin new layer of powder is applied over the entire print area and the process repeats. Each new layer fuses to the one underneath it and slice by slice, the final print takes shape. There are many factors that need to be just right for this to work, like setting the laser power and print speed, uh, the powder needs to be really consistent for the parts to turn out well, and all this is happening in a controlled shielding gas atmosphere to keep the powder from degrading or catching on fire during the print. But let's go step by step in this Academy episode and start with what you can do to get great metal prints before you even start up the printer, and that's by designing parts correctly. Now, you may think that because the part is completely surrounded by powder while it's being printed, it's fully supported everywhere and parts can just be the craziest shapes without any problem. But it's still metal that's being printed and printing means that as material is added, it's actually fully molten down so that it welds to the rest of the part. Now, metals, like most materials, have the property that as they cool, they shrink. As you add layers, your bottom layers have already cooled, while the fresh top layer is of course still completely hot and will shrink. So if you don't have your part anchored down and supported, it's going to warp and bowl up, which is why this process still needs support material like this, even though the parts are already encased by the powder. But support should be the last resort for making parts printable. They add cost for the extra material used, but also need to be manually removed once the part is done. You can already go a long way by following some simple design rules, and if you've already used FDM or SLA printers, these will sound really familiar. Let's go through three of them and see how they can make your parts more easily printable. Number one, overhangs. Overhangs are any area of a part that hangs over the edge of what's underneath it. Say we're trying to print this part right here in this orientation, any area like the one on the underside here will only be partially supported by what's already been printed at that point. Which means two things. There's less solid material there to resist shrinking forces, so that area is more likely to curl inwards, but there's also less material there for cooling. If the heat from the melting process has no way to escape to quickly enough, areas can actually overheat and degrade the print quality. You can push some metals further than others here, but generally a 45 degree angle can be considered safe. This is 30 degrees. Because that's in the direction of printing, sometimes you can get around that by just rotating or flipping the part before printing. Like this one, you could just print on its side. But it's best to account for it in the design already. While designing parts for metal 3D printing, you should already know in which orientation your part will be printed and design for it accordingly. Many overhangs that are too steep can be made printable by shallowing the slope and adding a bit more material underneath it. The alternative is using more support material, like here, which may be an option if your finished part needs to be as lightweight as possible, but the extra material is used up in either case. Now, the next design rule you may already know is a nice get out of jail free card from 3D printing with polymers, and that's bridging, connecting two pillars with a perfectly horizontal layer of material. Essentially, this is a 90 degree overhang with another pillar on the other side. But unfortunately, printing bridges is just not an option for metal 3D printing. Not because the process can span that bridge, but because again, of, of cooling requirements. Bridges need to be fully supported in any case, so you don't need to worry about them being perfectly horizontal. Again, try different orientations for the part, 
Again, this one could be printed on its side. Um, maybe you can avoid these areas completely. So lastly, how fine can these machines print? Okay, this one is something that actually has a lot of factors going into it. First, the metal powder itself has a grain. Then the laser used to fuse it has a spot size and does melt a relatively wide track of the powder. Then there's again the challenge of cooling super tiny details, parts potentially slightly warping. Under the right circumstances, metal 3D printers are actually capable of reducing fairly fine details. But let's look at what rules you should follow to get consistent and repeatable parts. First, wall thickness. If you have a single freestanding longish wall, it should be at least half a millimeter thick. These are a lot thicker. And because laser powder bed fusion, LPBF, has a fairly high resolution, there's no need to worry about matching the wall thickness to multiples of the laser spot diameter. Now, walls can be half a millimeter, but actual positive features, like a little knob, raised text, or a latch, should be at least one millimeter in diameter or width, like these. Negative features like engravings or holes through a part, like through this one, um, of course, pose a cleanup issue. There's support material in here. <laughs> the raw powder needs to be removed from them before they're usable too. Through holes should be at least two millimeters large for good accuracy. These are larger, obviously. One millimeter is possible, but is already pushing it. But if there are straight bores, there's always the option to drill or even ream holes to size. Remember, these parts are all essentially solid metal, so they can be worked like a machined solid part. Now, there are a few more advanced tricks and design rules that you should keep in mind for designing parts for metal printing, like knowing how much material each layer should contain to minimize overheating artifacts like these. And increasingly, there are also simulation tools becoming available that can show you which areas could be problematic. But for now, it's up to you as the designer to create parts that are properly printable. And if you know what you're doing, you can even push each of these restrictions. But let's go through the three rules again. Overhangs. Stay below 45 degrees or reorient your parts. Bridges. Unlike other additive processes, bridges cannot be printed in LPBF. And feature size. 0.5 millimeters for walls, 1 millimeter for positive features, and 2 millimeters for negative features. And that's it for today. Let us know what tips you'd like to see next, and stay tuned for more.